All right, here we go in three, two, one. What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Sports Medicine Broadcast Women in Athletic Training with Tanya Watson. So Tanya's going to get to share uh, most of her story, but before we get started, she has been quite a few places. She is actually from, she's a native Texan. She actually grew up right here in Pasadena for the first, you know, like five years of her life, I think. And then they moved to New Mexico where she spent the majority of her growing up. But Tanya, you are a native Texan. You were born in Texas, so you can come home anytime. Right? <laughs> I'm, pr oh, I'm pretty close. I'm less than an hour. So El Paso is about 40 minutes. So I'm not not too far. <laughs> there you go. All right. So now she's in Las Cruces, New Mexico, but she's been to Hattiesburg, Mississippi. She's been to Wyoming. Uh, and then she was a faculty member there in New Mexico. Is that right? Yes. New Mexico State University. In New Mexico for, for State time. University, where she went to graduated from. So that's, she's going to share that as part of her story. But we're talking about women in athletic training. So she's had a lot of different experiences. She also um, interacts with the, with the podcast a lot. And so uh, thanks Tanya for, for being on, for just being active and interacting and, you know, supporting what we do as athletic trainers. This episode is sportsmedicinebroadcast.com slash Tanya Watson. So T-A-N-Y-A -A Watson. And then obviously I got Kathy, you know what? I, I knew it. I knew it. All right. <laughs> so her name is S-U-P-A-K and it's Shupa. Shupak. Tupac, see? And because one time she told me, you say it like Tupac. And so then I always think, and it's, and you know, I, I, you always hear people say it wrong, Supac. Uh, and so I just, for some reason, I knew it. I was like, I got to practice it. But which way do I practice it? I was like, so I got Kathy. I got my good friend, Kathy. She's been in lots of leadership roles. Uh, and she's here, works with me here in Pasadena ISD uh, for Houston Methodist Hospital and does a fantastic job in kind of leading our, our uh, program or helping lead our program to grow and to, to do more rather than just uh, continue to do the same thing. So, Kathy, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. All right, Tanya, it is your time to shine. So tell us your story other than what I didn't fill in. <laughs> um, so, yes, I, I was born outside. I was born in Deer Park, Texas. Uh, my dad is actually uh, from a farming community outside of Las Cruces, New Mexico. My parents said met, met and married in in Deer Park. Um, so I did get my start out in Texas. Um, I uh, then, we, so we moved to Las Cruces when I was in first grade. Um, grew up here in Las Cruces. I found out about my passion of athletic training as a middle schooler. Um, so we all know uh, those young kids who have those growing pains, right? They get growth spurts and their knees hurt and their ankles hurt. Um, so a neighbor who lived like two doors up from the house that I grew up in was actually the program director at New Mexico State University um, back in the, um, happened back in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and she and my mom actually got their, their master's together. So that's my, how my parents knew her. And that's how I got hooked up with athletic training, my first exposure to athletic trainers as a middle schooler. Um, playing volleyball, playing soccer, doing swimming, just a very active uh, kid. And so I said, I had those growing pains that my doctor sent me to physical therapy, sent me for rehab physical therapy for, but because my mom and dad knew, said the program director, Leah Putman, um, I went to actually their athletic training clinic on campus where I worked with the clinical coordinator um, and the students who were in the athletic training education program. Um, then I said that was my first exposure to athletic trainer. I had a great um, high school athletic trainer, Daryl Wooten. Um, he's still practicing in the community. I didn't do it as a high school student. I wasn't a high school athletic training aide just because, again, I was attempting to be an athlete. <laughs> Even though I realized I, I wasn't going to be a good enough athlete to go to college and play athletics. Um, you know, I did, you know, I said I played soccer. I did swimming. I did track and field. I was very active in other things. So I just couldn't figure out how to do that as a high school student. But I knew athletic training is what I wanted to do because I enjoyed sports. Um, I enjoyed learning about the human body. I wanted to do something in medicine. I just didn't know kind of what. Um, but then I got to college, majored in athletic training, um, went to New Mexico State University, which is literally like right across the highway from the house that I grew up in. Um, so the lady who introduced me to athletic training, Leah Putman, was my program director through my undergraduate career. And I worked with 
some several great athletic trainers um, at New Mexico State who've kind of helped fuel my passion for the profession um, and also helped to helped us and my my classmates understand the importance of service to the profession also being involved with leadership being involved with the state organization um, and said pro- giving back to the profession that we really enjoy and and have a passion for once I graduated from Mexico State I went up to grad school at the University of Wyoming um, and I back then which really wasn't too long ago um, said it's they the college setting has really grown as far as how many staff they have on on hand but Back then, I look at it as kind of like a really well-staffed, um, understaffed as far as a college setting, but said well-staffed, maybe D2 school. Um, I was the only graduate assistant with four full-time athletic trainers. So everybody kind of helped everybody out because um, we still had football, men's and women's track, men's and women's swimming, um, and, you know, basketballs, soccer. So we had a lot, we still had a full gamut of sports, but everybody kind of helped everybody else out. There wasn't I had my sport assignments, but I still did a lot of wrestling, did a lot of soccer, even though those, those weren't my primary sport assignments. Um, so I did enjoy my time up in Wyoming. It was definitely a very different um, environment. Got exposed to actually what cold meant <laughs> living up there. Uh, so I kind of went from the extremes of Southern New Mexico where we can, not necessarily as hot as Phoenix and Tucson, but we can hit those temperatures um, in the summer, summer um, to you know the, the extreme cold in Wyoming. So I get to see athletic training in both extremes from heat illness to uh, worry about, you know, cold injuries too. Um, uh, after I graduated from Wyoming, then I went to my first full-time job was at University of Alabama, Birmingham. Um, again, worked with some great athletic trainers, Mike Jones, Brian Cook, Brian Combs, uh, Heloise Bellarmino Jones um, was actually kind of the clinical assistant physician extender with our team uh, team physician at Children's Hospital in Birmingham. Um, so again, worked with women, start with, got started with women's basketball there, um, oversaw a lot of the women's, um, all, of, all of the graduate assistants that worked with women's sports. So um, again, got exposure to leadership and mentorship with the graduate assistants um, at Birmingham, Alabama. And then spent two years there and then went to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where I worked at Southern Miss for three years. Um, and again, I was an associate athletic trainer at Southern Miss. So the, guy, the gentleman who hired me at Wyoming, Todd McCall, left Wyoming and went to Southern Miss. Um, and when he had his women's basketball athletic trainer, um, got an opportunity to move up and go to Florida State. Um, he called me and asked if I was interested in the job. Um, at th- so I was there at Southern Miss for three years. And then my parents were getting older. Um, they were starting to have some health issues. So I put my put my career um, first. So athletic was saying before we started recording, athletic training for a lot of us can be kind of nomadic, especially if you're working college athletics, you know, it kind of takes you wherever the job is. Um, you can either, like I keep telling students, you can either choose your setting or you can choose your geographic location. Um, if you want to choose your setting, you've got to be able to move for that setting. Um, If you want to choose your geographic location, you've got to be open to the different settings that you want to work in. So I got to a point where my parents were getting older, having some health issues, and I needed to move home. So that's when I moved back to Las Cruces to kind of help out with help out with some um, elderly parents. And I went from the college setting to a physician's office setting. Um, So I worked as a um, my title when I left ended up being clinic manager. So it was in where it even though I was still doing a lot of clinical duties with the physicians, um, I also had some administrative uh, role with the clinic itself. Also, um, working directly with the physicians in clinic with patients. Um, I did not go into surgery like some clinics do. Um, I didn't go into the OR like uh, a lot of the residencies uh, train athlete uh, train athletic trainers. But I was in the cast room doing casting, bracing, DME. Um, helping with patient care, that kind of stuff. Um, then the opportunity came that to be a term faculty emergency hire at the university. And I had enjoyed my adjunct teaching that I did when I was at other universities, when I was at Wyoming and at Southern Miss. I would teach a couple of classes and I kind of had been missing that. 
Um, so the opportunity came to go work at the university to be a term hire because they had a faculty member leave right before the semester started. Um, so I taught there as a term faculty for about two years and said so that you can only hold that position, position for so long. Um, that came up. And then now I'm at my alma mater, the high school that I graduated from at Las Cruces High School. So I've been here since August and it's definitely, I've, there's a said, I'm loving working with the kids, said the, helping them rehab, get them back to their sports um, is definitely the, that, that passion that we all find as athletic trainers is helping those kids go from their, their lowest point from injury to kind of their highest point, returning them back to their sport that they love. All right. So now that you've been, all right. Um, hey, I think your speakers are feeding me. Can you hear that? Mm -hmm. Like you can hear a reverb. Oh no, no, I can't hear. Is I'm getting an echo? Yeah, but I think it's okay now. We'll, okay. we'll see in a second. So, um, so you've been through the working at the college, teaching at a college, and working in a, a doctor's office. And now you're at a high school. So tell me, as of right now, which one have you? Would would do you think you would go to back to if you were if you were going to have to change, or which one? I guess has been your favorite. Ah, uh, you know they all take. They all have their their benefits, and they all have kind of their take backs. Um, you know, working in the physician's clinic, I really enjoyed that working hand in hand with my physician. Um, but, you know, I was missing some of the, the game coverage. And so I, I would get to know patients, um, but I wasn't doing with some of that patient, wasn't doing a whole lot of patient care as far as rehab and, and that kind of stuff. Um, I was instrumental in their navigating the healthcare system, helping advocate for them with insurance companies, getting them um, to a different specialist that maybe it was in, in not necessarily the best referral to an ortho, or maybe we needed further testing with a neurologist or whatever the case may have been. Um, and it helped open my eyes to different aspects of the healthcare system too, that has been, I think, instrumental as far as um, being in the high school, knowing um, maybe, just knowing how insurance companies work, um, knowing how to, again, help navigate that healthcare system. Um, knowing that maybe, you know, for thoracic outlet syndrome, ortho is not exactly the most appropriate referral. Um, we're kind of, so knowing, getting a better understanding, getting a better, I feel like my um, evaluation diagnosis skills are heightened from working in that experience, in that setting for a long time and working so closely with a physician and seeing such a variety um, and being able to explain to student athletes um, why care, proper care now is important down the road, um, why we take care of that knee injury, that knee sprain, that tendonitis now to prevent the osteoarthritis or debilitation they find later on in their um, in their career or in their life. Um, I enjoyed the travel with a, with the college. Like I was telling my colleague um, the other day, she asked if I'd ever go back to the college setting. Um, so at the beginning of the season, travel's great. You go to new places, you have fun, you meet up with colleagues you haven't seen for a while. Um, at the end of the season, travel's draining. You know, you get to the end of the season, you're like, okay, another road trip. And, uh, you know, when am I going to be able to have like a good solid week in my own bed and stuff like that? So every every setting has their takeaways. Um, I do like working with the high school. Um, you know, we have a little bit more freedom to an extent with a, with a college student. Um, high school students, we have to be a little bit more with Parents, I mean, I dealt with parents in high school at the college setting too. Um, so you still have to call parents and let them know what's going on with their kid. Um, but with, it, with par uh, high school, where I definitely talked to parents a lot more than I did um, in the college setting. Um, I said, in talking to talking to parents before we make that referral, and you know, making sure that even though we have a relationship with a certain orthopedic office, um, if the parents prefer somebody else because of their previous relationship you know, making sure they get to that, where the parents want them to go to. So it's not just all our decision of where to send a kid to. Um, so we've got a, it's a lot more negotiation, not negotiation, but conversation with parents and keeping them, making sure they're 
part of that conversation too, not just making that decision of, of when and where to send, send a kid. Tanya, you have very impressive work. I have to tell you that. <laughs> Thank um, you. Your, you know, your experience. You have a lot of tools in your tool belt, and you expanded on that. You know, w working in the different settings. So you are now back. I, I think you said since August at your high school alma mater. But you, you know, you mentioned that you were not a um, student aide mm -hmm. in high school. So, um, kind of two things. What is your typical day like now that you are in the high school setting? And um, what experience did you bring from the collegiate setting that you probably use the most on a daily basis now that you're in the high school setting? So I get to the office um, about 7.15, 7.30 in the morning. Um, I have student athletes that start coming in at 7.30 uh, for rehab and treatment before class. Um, the, first, the first bell rings about 8.30, so I try to get as many kids cleared out um, to get to who don't have an athletic period. Um, the ones who actually have a class first period, about 8.30, we get them cleared out um, onto their first class. And then the women's sports, volleyball and basketball have a first, peri first period um, athletic period. So some of those basketball athletes or volleyball athletes who are doing rehabs or long-term, I have a volleyball player right now who's doing um, an ACL rehab. Um, so she'll come in about 7.45, 8 o'clock to start her rehab. And during that first period, we continue um, continue her rehab um, for her post-surgery. And then um, I have a few other volleyball and basketball players that are coming in for different things during that time. I do have a couple aides that work um, that have that class, that athletic training class period during that first period. Um, it changes from day to day just because of the way our schedule is. Um, so, so the first period is that we're again, we're working with, with athletes doing their rehabs, doing treatments. And we're here in case something happens during that practice. So if somebody goes down during volleyball practice or basketball practice, we're here and available. And then during the second period of day, I teach a sports medicine class. Um, mm -hmm. So I leave the athletic training room and go to an actual classroom um, where I teach a sports medicine class to just anybody can sign up for those. Um, I teach a sports medicine one Monday, Wednesday, and a sports medicine two Tuesday, Thursday. And then again, Fridays rotate just because of the type of schedule that we have. Um, once I get done with a sports medicine class, I come back to the athletic training room and uh, I have a few kids that come in for the ones who take the bus and they can't get here in the morning. Well, they'll come in at lunch to do some rehab, start some rehab exercises. And then my my planning period, <laughs> um, it's supposed to, on paper, it's my planning period, but I typically do have kids who have um, an off off period. Um, so, so juniors and seniors are allowed to have off periods. Um, so I have a couple kids who have off periods that come in to do their rehabs. Um, again, I have a couple kids who are not who are surgical post-op patients, and I really like having that um, downtime where I can spend more with those kids. Um, I have an ACL that's coming in for uh, her surgery, uh, medial patella, medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction that comes in. Um, I've got another ACL that's starting to come in this week, um, so I can spend that little more focused time with them during that time. It's not as crazy as the before school or after school time when I can have an athletic training full of kids. Um, so I, it's supposed to be my planning period where I can work on grading and class prep and stuff, but I usually end up having kids and doing rehabs and treatments and stuff. And then during the last period of day again is when um, football and basketball have their athletic periods. So again, we'll have, they'll have, um, basketball will be practicing, um, football has their workouts and their stuff going on. So again, uh, some of those kids who can't practice um, will come in and we're available in case something happens in those in those settings that I can run out to the court. Um, I'm not having to get pulled out of a, a classroom in case something happens. So then 3.30, the bell rings, and then all chaos breaks loose in the athletic training room. I'm sure you said, Jeremy, you work in the high school, so you know it is trying to get those kids out to practice. Um, you know, as soon as the bell rings, we've got track coming in, baseball coming in, kids getting taped, getting quick treatments before they head out. Um, and then again, we have um, kids coming in that in the afternoon to finish up what they didn't get done in the morning um, or to start just because it's again bus schedules. Um, Las Cruces is in a town but it's kind of on the outskirts so we've got a lot of rural kids too in addition to some of the this uh, the town kids, city kids. So a lot of times I've got a very diverse socioeconomic student body. Um, we have kids coming from very affluent families and we have kids coming from very poor families. Um, so 
I do have to be cognizant that, you know, I can't say everybody's going to come in at 730. No questions asked because some kids, you know, that's not an option for them because they've got to take the bus in um, or we've got to find time here and there to get some stuff done because they've got to take the bus home um, because they don't have some of the resources or access that some of the other middle class and more affluent um, student body may have. So I've got I've got to be understanding of that. Um, at the same time of trying to get them back to where they need to as far as games and practices and stuff. All right, so we've discussed a lot of different, like you said, you worked all the different places you worked. And then, um, and again, as we're focusing on female and athletic training, I, I do want to make sure that I, I guess, throw this out there. I don't want to, the popular word is mansplain, like <laughs> the, the being the female thing, right? And so I actually had my wife look over the notes to make sure that nothing was like too, I don't know if sexist is the right word, but like I said, you know, and so I want to make sure if I do say something, I apologize. I, I'm i not the best with words. And so I, again, I want to, as a female in athletic training, um, tell me some of the people that you have really looked up to uh, as you've been learning, as you've been becoming a leader in athletic training? Um, so I said, my program director, Leah Putman, um, she I said she introduced me to, to the profession. Um, and I said, I, the, my head athletic trainer at New Mexico State, Michael Larry, um, and my high school athletic trainer, Daryl Wooten, they're all still very active in the community, um, in the athletic training community here in Las Cruces. Um, and it's like moving on to grad school. So I worked with uh, Ronnie Beatty. She's actually at University of Minnesota now. And Shanda Fuqua, they were um, big instrumental um, role models to me as I was starting out on my own um, early in my profession as a graduate assistant. Um, so James Dorn, who's at you know University of Connecticut, University of Connecticut, he's men's basketball at University of Connecticut, and said Tom McCall, who's now at Southern Miss. Um, you know, they said they all, because we were such a small staff um, when I started at Wyoming, um, we all just really worked to help each other and they really helped to mentor me and help shape me um, as a new young professional, as a new certified athletic trainer, um, help giving me the space that I needed to grow as a professional, but still give me that safety net in case I needed anything. Um, so sort of helping, helping me figure out who I was as a, as an athletic trainer. Um, which was really helpful because when I got to um, Alabama, Birmingham, the roles reversed really quickly. You know, all of a sudden I was a full-time staff member and I was the one mentoring um, young, newly certified uh, athletic trainers working with women's sports and learning how to help them figure out who they were and how to, you know, going from that student role to the certified being the person in charge. Um, I think I left this out, but I said, I graduated from my undergrad in December, so I kind of had a, a semester where um, a lot of graduate assistants don't shop, start up in January. So I kind of had like a, a semester where I had to figure out what I was gonna do. Um, at that time, New Mexico State had an internship, just like a, a one semester internship. So I kind of had a nice, easy transition from being a student to learning how to be a certified athletic trainer again with um, people that I had worked with and learned under um, who had the confidence in me to kind of take over that role. And I worked with a small track team, just a women's track team. Um, so again, I had a small athlete number that I was responsible for um, in a very supportive community um, with good mentors, um, role models who helped uh, helped to shape me to the be um, the athletic trainer that I am today. Um, said so, so I, I, and why, when I went to Alabama, I that that with a lot of us, when that happens, that that role gets reversed really quickly from being mentee to being mentor um, and said I had good uh, mentors before me that helped me to, I'm not saying that I, I said, I'm sure I made mistakes and there's things that we, we can all learn to be better. That's why we do professional development, whether it's CEUs or just on, on our own learning. Um, but I said that really helped to to shape me and learn that lifelong learning passion that, that I have um, with constantly looking for things to, to improve, whether it's rehab skills, or or leadership or mentorship um, to help with others. Um, so the, the gentleman who hired me at Wyoming also hired me at Southern Miss. And at Southern Miss, I, again, I was associate 
athletic trainer. So again, I was more of a mentor role um, at Southern Miss with for the graduate assistants. But I had other mentors who weren't necessarily athletic trainers. Um, so my SID, who kind of was, who was also the associate sports information director, um, we leaned on each other a lot. Um, so even though she wasn't an athletic trainer, she was a former athlete. She worked in the athletic department. Um, my senior women's administrator also was a good mentor as far as leadership um, working in the athletic department, even though they weren't necessarily athletic trainers. So looking for those resources, even if they aren't somebody necessarily directly in your profession or necessarily in your office can be can be important. And again, they can give a different perspective than necessarily what we see um, in our setting. They can give you know kind of a little bit more objective uh, viewpoint sometimes that that we may need. You mentioned a lot of different people. So when I, the, in the last podcast, when I was talk, talking with Nancy Burke, uh, right, NATA Hall of Famer, she said she actually had no problem with saying that the men were her mentors. And mm -hmm. because the, they were the people who had the skills and the experience and they could teach her. And it, in your sharing, it wasn't necessarily that you went to all, only the women, but you had a lot of men and women that were kind of your mentors or, or that you learned from. And uh, did you find that you intentionally went towards females because you were a female or you just went to whoever would teach you? Uh, I just went to whoever, to whoever would teach me, whoever I had, we had time and access to. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of at my age, I'm kind of on that cusp of old school and new school. Um, so, you know, when I was going through my education and early career, there was still, a, it was still, you know, there was a lot of women, you know, there's a lot of women working as athletic trainers, um, but a lot of the leadership positions were still held by men. Um, so we, we've seen a lot of statistics where women leave the profession earlier, um, especially during that time because of family and such like that and stuff like that. So they were leaving a lot of the traditional settings. Um, whereas the men are, well, there were more men being head athletic trainers and stuff like that. Um, so you couldn't just focus. I was, I was able to get a few female mentors. Um, but I said, the, I said the men, as, the men were still just as much mentors I said as women. Um, but I was able to have a little bit of that mix and be able to go to different people for di different things. Um, based on the situation or the time or just who was kind of available to help me, um, help me with that. Um, so I said, yeah, I was kind of right on that cusp of women being able to stay in, whether it's either, like I said, I, I put my career first um, for a long time um, before I put my, my family first. Um, so there were a lot, there was getting more women who were either able to find that balance to have the family and stay in the, the traditional setting um, or again, situations like I was where they were putting their career first before, before family. So they were staying in the profession longer. Um, I think now we're able to, whether it's male or female, um, where a lot of us are being able to find that work-life balance, um, that they're able to ha have that family life and still stay in the profession. Whereas, you know, for a long time, even some of my mentors, um, the male mentors, just because of the gender stereotypes that men men worked and women took care of the the kids. Um, those are some of the the older athletic trainers, and you know they admit that they missed out on a lot of their kids' events. And you know some of the younger male athletic trainers are nowadays are able to because of staffing ratios getting a little bit better. Um, they're able to make some more of those events that some of our older athletic trainers missed out on because of games and practices and travel. So so the profession is still has a ways to go, and we're still working on that. But it is a little bit better um, than what it used to be even said 15, 20, 30 years ago. Can you uh, discuss some of the challenges you faced um, as, a, as a woman uh, in athletic training? So again, I, I talked about like my age, I was kind of really on that cusp of um, different opportunities. So now we're seeing, you know, more women being working in the NFL, major league baseball, that kind of stuff. When I was in school, um, it was, it was, um, you know, there women being able to go and get those internships at the NFL in the summer or baseball internships, um, you know, you kind of got, you got looked over, 
you know, you, you had expressed my opinion and my interest in doing this for a summer. And they're like, well, you know, I'm sorry because you're a girl. That's, you know, you can apply, but you're not, your chances aren't going to be very good. Um, so I, I kind of got, just because of that, you know, I kind of got discouraged from doing that. Um, just because I was told, well, your chances aren't going to be a good, I didn't take that chance. Um, so I opted to, you know, do summer school and, and work in the summer instead of, instead of getting some of that experience. Um, obviously that's changed a lot. So we, now we have, you know, women working in the NFL, major league baseball. Um, it, it's a lot, uh, more fair, I guess. Um, you know, they're still, they can still make, you know, improvements, but it said it's not as difficult. So the, the girl, the women who first got those usually it was because of those connections and I didn't have those connections. So I didn't take that chance, um, when I was younger. So that was, that was part of it. Um, so I, I mentioned, it's not a really a challenge, but I said, I left, I left the college setting, I left the traditional setting, um, to go to one of the emergency settings just because of my, most, most women, it's because they get married and have children. Um, my, my reason for leaving the traditional setting initially was because of elderly parents. Um, so again, that was kind of the, the gender stereotypes, gender norms, um, still falling into that. I mean, I said, I, I left the college setting to come home, take care of parents. Um, and I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't change that for the world. Um, but it's, you know, it, it, when I talk to people about that, they're like, yeah, it's the daughters that do that, not the sons. Um, there are other factors that, that are part of that, but, you know, I said, as a, you know, as a daughter who wasn't living at home, I felt it was important to come home, um, and end up having to leave the traditional setting because of that. Um, so I did find my way back into it. I still, so worked as an athletic trainer, um, just said in the physician's office rather than as, um, in a high school or a college, like, I don't think I could have taking care of my parents and gone to doctor's appointments with my parents if I had been working in a high school or working in the college and being on the road traveling with a team and stuff. So, and that, those are all different things that are kind of said again, may, men do that too, um, but uh, women do it on a much higher scale than, than men do. Yeah, that was kind of one of my thoughts there. I actually, I, can't really see myself saying, okay, well, I have to leave this job so I can go live close to my parents and take care of them. But then like my mom just recently had surgery. My sister came in from Virginia and my other sister is in, you know, staying in town with her three kids while her husband is staying out of town or where they live for like three or four weeks. And for me, I was like, well, that's just not really an option, you know? And like, I just, of course it could just be me then maybe I'm a jerk or something, but uh, <laughs> Like I, that just doesn't like, that's not what I'm supposed to do. And one of the things I just wrote down in the notes is that you felt like an internal pressure. It wasn't somebody saying, Hey, you had to do this, but you felt like an internal pressure to, to go home and take care of things other than work. Whereas I feel like I got to go take care of work so that I can take care of my family. So right. um, can you talk just a little bit more about like that internal feeling or that, that need to take care of other people? Um, and I, I think that's, I think that's kind of inherent to athletic trainers though, too. I mean, I think that's why a lot of us get into the profession is we want to help people and take care of people. Um, it's just kind of where that focus is. Um, you know, I, you know, I, my, I knew my brothers said wouldn't be able to do that. Um, so, I mean, I, I wanted to do that for my parents. Um, so, I, you know, that was, I did feel that need, but I said, I also felt that need for, I feel that need every day for, for my kids, for my, my high school kids, taking care of them. Um, but I said, it's, I said, there are men that, that do that also, but I said, it's just women do that at a higher rate. And I think that's kind of that, that gender norm, that society that we have of taking care of women I said women leave the profession at a higher rate. Usually it's more because they get married and have kids, but I said, mine was just, Said the opposite is that my parents were getting were getting older and needed help um so, so that's when i had to just change my career focus i just said i didn't get out i just changed that that focus of where i was at um but i said that's why a lot of us get into athletic training or why we get into medicine um is because we have this internal motivation to help people it's just where we focus that that motivation whether it's towards our family or towards other, helping other people 
Um, so I said the the things that my parents were going through. So my my background, my education was instrumental in helping to advocate for them. Um, said so going to doctor's appointments with them, understanding, um, helping them understand what was going on. Um, and by changing the setting that I was working in, I was able to do that for them. Um, but I said, it's, it was just, it's where life took me. It's where my career took me. Um, and I was happy to do it um, at that time. I was able to get some good quality time with my, with my parents because I was able to uh, make that. I was, I felt secure enough to be able to make that change, um, to leave that the college setting to come, come home and and be able to make that career change and confident enough in my experience and my education that I would be able to come home to a smaller community and still find a job that would put my again my education and uh, experience um, to use. Well, Tanya, I just want to confirm that, uh, you know, you're not the only person in this position. You know, there's athletic trainers all over the country, both male and female, that have struggled with the life balance, whether it be with kids or some of us have dealt with the kids and are dealing with the parents as well. So right. the life balance is not, you know, exclusive to, you know, someone with kids or somebody with, uh, you know, parents, aging parents. So, you know, if anybody ever figure out the answer, they're going to make a whole lot of money. <laughs> exactly. <You know? laughs> like finding a cure for shin splints. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, it is. It is. Uh, it's something, you know, uh, it's obviously not unique to our profession. No, absolutely but It not. is unique to our profession, you know, because of the demands on our job. But um, um, it sounds like you, you know, you were able to 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 find a way to uh, continue your your passion, you know, in athletic absolutely. training. And and still be able to help out your parents, and I applaud you for that. I really do. Thank you. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was it was definitely a leap of faith um, when I did it. Um, I said I I had come home for on vacation, seen kind of what was going on at home with my parents and stuff. Um, and I basically, when I left to go back to work, um, I made the decision that I can't. I can't be 24 hours away from home if something happened. So basically went back and said, you know what, this, I, I, I got a, I didn't have a job when I moved home. Um, I basically went in and said, you know, here's, here, you know, here's my two weeks, three weeks notice. Um, I've basically got to move back home um, uh, because of what was going on. Um, said moved home and so luckily I was only out of work for about a week, two weeks at the most, um, just because, you know, things kind of fell into place fairly quickly as far as a job. Um, but, you know, so that was, so that was a leap of faith that I took that it ended up working out for the, for the, um, for the better. One of the <laughs> that I recently saw, I think it was from Anonymous, but it was a, somebody saying as a female working with D1 sports, you always feel the, the need to be strong so that the coaches or players don't like look down on you. And my response to that was your care and compassion and connection with the players and the coaches is what got you in that position. And, and that's kind of what you're saying here is that you're, you're able to connect, but what are some of the things that you feel like you bring to athletic training, to your athletes, to your patients, uh, specifically as a female? Um, I think I can, I can provide, I can pro provide both sides. Like I can be, you know, I can be the strict person that, you know, the hard person about, you know, pushing them to get them back. Um, but I think my experience um, of the different settings um, of athletes that I've worked with, um, I feel like I have learned to kind of read the situation and read the athlete, um, knowing the athlete who needs the compassion and the care and knowing the athlete when they need to be pushed. Um, or even just that situation. Today we need a little compassion. Um, tomorrow we need to be pushed um, to our limits. Um, again, not that men can't do that, um, and I have I've seen men do that also. Um, but I said I when I was at Al so I grew up on the border here in Las Cruces, where you know Mexico is literally like less than a the mile away. So um, whatever your political <laughs> opinions are of of our current immigration status, I, I grew up in a very diverse area. Um, being so close to the border 
growing up in a college town. Again, the college brings in all sorts of ethnicities and cultures. So I grew up in a very diverse area. I'm exposed to a lot of different people of cultures um, and race. Um, and it, it really helped me when I moved on um, to other places. When I was at Birmingham, um, Alabama, Birmingham, uh, the story I like to tell my students and I like, I like to tell my GAs uh, is so when I was at Alabama, Birmingham, my first, second year there, um, soccer coach came in um, and said, hey, we've got a Norwegian player that's coming in late. You know, her uh, immigrate or her visa, planes, that stuff. She came in a couple days later than the rest of the team for two days. Um, so we're going to bring her in. Do you mind? You know, and I was going to take her to get her her physical with the team physician and kind of get all that stuff done and so that you get going with the team. I'm like, OK, great. Um, I'm expecting a Norwegian soccer player. So what does everybody think a Norwegian soccer player is going to look like? Six foot tall blonde, right? So what walks into my athletic training as a Norwegian soccer player is a five foot Sudanese refugee who was adopted by a Norwegian family. Um, so that just all of a sudden my my assumptions of who was going to walk in my athletic training room as a Norwegian soccer player um, got kind of turned on its head, <laughs> especially since I had worked with a couple of Norwegian athletes, um, track athletes at Wyoming. So she, um, as a Sudanese refugee during the Civil War with Sud in Sudan, he had seen a lot of atrocities that our student athletes and here in the U.S. just have no comprehension of. Um, so she really struggled um, her first semester. And the graduate assistant working with athletic trainer, um, a graduate assistant athletic trainer working with soccer, really struggled in connecting with her also. Um, she just the because I was kind of the first contact for this a student athlete, um, she felt a little bit more comfortable coming to me um, because I was the per first person that kind of took her around, took her to the team physician. Um, so this the graduate assistant athletic trainer just couldn't had a hard time understanding that or connecting with this this refugee, um, this this young lady who had been, who had you know escaped some um, a war torn area, um, but because of my exposure again to different cultures, different ethnicities. Um, I had a little easier time navigating my relationship with her and um, being able to talk to, to this athlete than the graduate assistant who um, grew up in a very middle-class white family in the South. Um, very, she went to a private, her undergraduate was at a private uh, Christian university. So she hadn't had a lot of different exposures. So she struggled with that. So trying to help my graduate assistant um, understand that and help teach her how to um, interact and help the athlete, but then again, helping that athlete um, during her time um, at, and helping her become more comfortable in a new culture, in a new country um, after leaving her safe area of, of Norway with her family. Um, so again, I said my experiences have been able. I've been learned. I've learned how to be that compassionate mothering figure, but then also be that um, person who can push the individual to and not letting them kind of slack off. And the kid who's hurting after surgery and getting them to understand it's going to hurt, and you're going to have to push through it. Um, and said so being able to know and navigate those those different situations and knowing which which situation calls for which version of Tanya to show up. What is your favorite part of being an athletic trainer? Uh, probably the relationships that we build, um, relationships with our uh, allies, with our healthcare partners, um, relationships with our coaches, relationships with our athletes. Um, you know, I was talking with some colleagues the other week that you know, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take I'm gonna take his words. Uh, the best thing about our job is time, and the worst thing about our job is time. So we get to spend the time with the kids to take them from their lowest point to their highest point. Um, but then that means we're also here early and we stay late and we have games and we have the weekend. Um, so building that relationship and being able to see those kids succeed um, and get back to sport after they've had the injuries. Um, is probably some of the, what helps, that, it's that external motivation that keeps us going to work every day. Kathy, what is your favorite thing about being an athletic trainer? I'm sorry, 
what is your favorite part about being an athletic trainer? I have to think because I've been one a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the interaction uh, with the students. You know, my entire career has been spent uh, at the secondary school tr uh, setting. And the appreciation um, from the athlete that somebody is actually listening to them, you know, and, and believes them. And then um, getting that getting that student some help um, and uh, and then seeing them return to the field. I think that 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 um, you know that never gets old. It never gets old. Um, you know, in, in this setting that I'm in now, the last three years, I've worked a lot with intermediate kids, and um, you know that's that, that's something I never really had done, and um, that it really it it brought back that joy that I, I I hadn't seen. You know, high school kids. There's a lot more pressure, a lot more you know parent pressure and the coaches. But you know, th at the intermediate. They're not sure if they're hurt, you know? <laughs> uh, but then seeing them, the, the parents, you know, uh, involvement, but that really brought that back for me. So it's, it's, it's doing why we got into this job, I think, was uh, helping somebody get back to play, I think is, is what I enjoy the most. All right, Tanya, here is the big question. If you are going to say something, or is, is there something specific that you would like to say to your male counterparts as a female athletic trainer? Oh, I thought I had an answer, but, you know, I said things that have, I have seen in the profession grow kind of leaps and bounds from, from where I started as a student. Um, you know, as a student, you know, when I was starting out first in my career, uh, I would have said that, you know what, women are just as capable of doing everything as men are. Um, but I think we've seen, we still have some, place, um, some places to grow as a profession, uh, but we've, we are seeing women kind of breaking those glass ceilings um, that were there uh, 20 years ago when I was starting out as a student. Um, you know, we're seeing more women becoming head athletic trainers, uh, more women going into administrative roles. Um, we've seen a lot more women in the leadership roles of NATA, um, from, you know, Julie Max and Marjorie Album being NATA presidents or even just holding district director positions and state state leadership positions. Um, and we're seeing women starting to break the barrier in the professional sports that we weren't having 20 years ago. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes as far as employment settings, those aren't always male athletic trainers making those decisions. Um, so I guess, and I think these the younger generation, again, men my age, the younger, um, the students now coming out of programs, the younger professionals um, advocating for each other. Um, so if you have an old school AD, um, just because you have two equally uh, qualified candidates, if the athletic trainer is not necessarily the one making that decision of, you know, male or female, um, so it may not always be an athletic trainer's decision when it comes to leadership or, or jobs and stuff. And is it helping us advocate for each other, um, I think is kind of the important thing moving forward. As a male, I, I am not super like in tune with the, with the female, mindset or, and the way they work and but i've learned a lot through conversation so i would encourage any of the women listening watching to continue to have this conversation over and over because because men are sometimes hard-headed and stubborn stuck in their ways and it just needs a a constant conversation i just need to learn a little bit at a time that my wife doesn't work the same as me right and so mm -hmm. we've been married for 13 years almost 14 years and i'm still learning she doesn't process things the same and so i just just keep having that conversation and don't give up on, on men. We're, we're not, uh, we're not hopeless. Like I've learned a lot. I've learned to communicate with her. I've learned to, to respect the, the differences. And, you know, obviously we're having this conversation here so that I can continue to learn and grow. Uh, I, I look up to Kathy. She's done a lot of great things and, uh, you know, I can always call her when, if I need something or if I need some advice, something like that. And, and so speaking from a guy to women, 
continue to have that conversation openly and honestly with men. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes it takes being rude or offensive, but most of the time I think a gentle conversation, uh, is going to work best. So, um, I think the last big question here for you, Tanya, and then Kathy, I'm gonna ask you this one too, is what do you want your legacy to be? Uh, That's a good question. Um, I guess, you know, I I think most of my my kids, whether it was my college kids that I still have contact with, um, or my current kids, my former students, um, you know, I think I think they would all say that, you know, I said that was kind of the the tagline from NATA from uh, National Athletic Training Month a couple of years ago was uh, compassionate care for all. Um, so I think most people would understand that, you know. I, I was a compassionate and I cared for them. Um, my international athletes are the same as my domestic athletes. Um, it didn't matter who you were, what sport you played. Um, one thing that I have strived to teach my students um, and that I try, I strive to model and practice every day is that, that compassionate care for all, um, whether it was the starting quarterback or the tennis player from uh, Macedonia, or said my rep, my Sud Sudanese refugee um, soccer player, um, they all got the same level of care and the same care that they needed and they required. Um, so, you know, you talk about some athletes need more time, they need more attention, um, but they were given what they needed when they needed, needed it. Kathy? <laughs> So Jeremy, first of all, I want to thank you for, uh, um, you know, starting this podcast from, you know, just nothing and reaching out to athletic trainers uh, internationally and, and hearing from people like Tanya that, uh, you know, what a great story. Uh, so thank you for having me on here. I think, I, I hope that my legacy will be that, um, you know, I left athletic training a little bit better than I found it. Uh, uh, I think I fall in the old school part that Tanya was talking about, um, but um you know, I hope athletic training uh, and um, you know, the, the process, uh, yeah, you know, especially how women, you know, are women athletic trainers, uh, you know, f are treated and the opportunities they have are, are maybe a little bit better um, than, you know, when I started and, and the athletes and the, the people that I work with. You know, that's you know, that's all that you can hope for, you know, but uh now, congratulations to you, Tanya, and, and all the work that you have done in, in your career. And I hope that you continue uh, as you can, you know, in, in helping with your parents to, in leadership, because we need leaders like you, not only in New Mexico, but in the NATA. Thank you. Thank you for, for your guys' work. And Jeremy, I have really enjoyed the podcast also. I'm glad I stumbled upon it in the your all your posts in secondary school Facebook group is that it's definitely hearing everybody's story is is that we can be working in secondary school too. We can be very kind of on our own island, isolated. Um, so having the podcast to listen to and that forum of that secondary group um, can help us realize that, you know, we're not on these islands by ourselves. You know, at, in the college setting, you work out of the same set, um, out of the same facility. So you have somebody to bounce things off of and, and talk to, but you go to secondary school you know, some people are by themselves, literally, you know, I've got a, I've got an assistant that comes out in the afternoon, so I'm not completely by myself um, in the afternoons, but so it's not a one, one woman show, um, but, you know, it's having the forums and, and podcasts like yours and, and Alicia Pennington's also um, can help us, you know, see that there are other people out there that may be facing some of the same struggles or um, give us different ideas on how to, to handle or treat things. Well, thanks for being active. Like I said, you comment a lot or retweet or share it. Um, but also I have in the chat, Brendan, Patrick Moriarty. Ruth has been watching a lot lately. Ruth uh, Gonzalez used to work over here in the district with me. Scott Arsenault, Jonathan Allen, Matt Babasek. I know Stephen Moss, Michelle Devereaux Hyatt. Uh, all of those were checking in live, at least on the Facebook that I saw. Uh, and again, thanks for, for joining me there. And you can see I've got... Right here behind Kathy, 
So if you're watching live stream, you can see I have the new Myotech shirt. Um, they've just signed on as a is a sponsor for the podcast. And so I want to continue to add. And then right next to right here, if you're watching the live stream, you can see my hand. It's right next to the green shirt. Kathy brought me a Houston Methodist shirt. So I continue to change the wall. Um, and Tanya, I know I sent you a shirt. Yes. So you can actually wear it without, uh, I guess, feeling like a, a pretender now that you've actually been a guest on the sports medicine broadcast. So I would love for this wall to be full and me to be fighting for space here. So if you can send me your shirt, I will put it up. Uh, yep. My address is here on, in the show notes, or it's you can send it to Jeremy Jackson, 206 South Shaver, Pasadena, Texas, 77506. I'll have that in the show notes there. Again, this is sportsmedicinebroadcast.com slash Tanya Watson. Tanya, somebody wants to get a hold of you. How are they going to do that? Uh, email is probably best. Um, so I'll give my Gmail address. Uh, it's T as in Tom, E as in Edward, Watson, W-A-T-S-O-N, 79 at gmail.com. All right. <laughs> Kathy, so let's get a hold of you. Oh, uh, Twitter. All right, so we'll have to look it up. Do you remember what it is? I don't remember what it is. I think we're going to have to put it on there. Or uh, uh, they can email me at C-S-U-P-A-K at HoustonMethodist.org. And then, obviously, if you want to get a hold of me, the easiest way is just go to SportsMedicineBroadcast.com. You'll have all those different ways to get a hold of me there. But if you're listening to this live or uh, if you've been listening for any time, I'm sure you've heard all the different ways to get a hold of me. So Tanya Watson over in Las Cruces, New Mexico, native Texan, still just hiding out just across the border from the homeland. Uh, I appreciate you joining us. They obviously, uh, if you're again, you're, if you're watching live, you can see some of the other sponsors: Free Hydration, like I said, Myotech, Hoist Hydration, or Drink Hoist. It's really cool. It's a good drink. I've got some here. I drink it all the time. Um, so those the sponsor support the podcast helps make it possible for me to continue to grow and do things and go to NATA. So Tanya, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and asking me to, to share my story. All right, Kathy, thank you very much. My pleasure. So for Jeremy, Kathy and Tanya Watson, that is a wrap. Thanks. <laughs>